Today we'll be discussing some of the saucy highlights from Sunday Super Bowl 54. Followed by some updates on the Iowa caucus that took place on Monday as we begin the countdown to the 2020 presidential election. And finally, we're bringing you the latest CSUF and local news. All this and more on today's episode of The Report. Hello and welcome to The Report, Cal State Fullerton's premier source for news, views, and info. I'm Ryan Matthey. And I'm Jefferson Denham. And I'm Bree Eastlick. Before we get started with our first hot topic, we'd like to invite you to be a part of the discussion. Click on the link in the description of any of our report episodes to fill out a secure Google form with your opinion on any controversial issue that we've talked about now or in the past, as many of these issues are reoccurring and evolving. We also have a Twitter account. Follow at the report CSUF to check out our polls, questions, and news updates. Everybody is still getting loud after Sunday's Super Bowl halftime performance. Jennifer Lopez and Shakira took to the Hard Rock Stadium in Miami for a performance some are calling show-stopping and high energy, with others deeming it disgusting and vulgar. Both women sang some of their greatest hits, paired with athletic and vigorous dance moves, but this is where people are questioning if the performance was too risque, especially for broadcast television. Between Shakira's tongue-flicking gesture, J-Lo's stripper pole, and the Cage children, all eyes were glued to their screens to see what would come next my eyes included my <laughs> goodness like it was like my whole playlist from 2005 was just all oh, back my, a little man. ipod nano i loved it i thought that whole performance was fantastic and there were a lot of subtle messages in here that i don't know if everybody else saw but we definitely saw so the first thing i want to say especially on twitter the big topic that there or everybody's talking about is was it too risque was it too much to have these women kind of showcasing themselves the way that they were what do you guys think about that well i'm going to say that uh basically Getting back to your eyes for a moment, there was an awesome tweet that said, oh, to be a rope held by Shakira. <laughs> I guess if you saw it, you'll know what that meant. I did not see it. I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't watch the game. I didn't watch it other than now. I've been watching some of the highlights of it. I think if you're going to ask Shakira and J-Lo to be on the halftime show, you got to know what you're getting, first exactly. of all. Exactly. Yeah. And so I I loved it. From the, from the highlights now that I've watched it after the fact, I think... It was fabulous, and I think they brought tons of energy. And uh, like you, and I'll let you guys unpack this more, the symbolism was profound. I think there was some really cool symbolism. Yeah, absolutely. I want to go into the gestures like we were talking about. Um, one of the parts was when there were children in cages, including JLo's daughter, Emmy, who was singing one of her songs. And... Um, Basically, J-Lo came out and said that, that it was a statement. And she said, quote, other people can try to build walls, keep us out, or put us in cages. We are proud to recognize that all of us together are what makes this beautiful country truly great, end quote. And I think a lot of people are like, just leave it to the music. You know, you're just performing. Why are you going to bring politics or anything else into this? But I think it's, if you have that big of a platform, if it's subtle, then yeah, I think it makes a big change and it can really speak to people. So what I loved most was you've got two Latina women singing in Miami, celebrating the Super Bowl. I think that's pretty awesome. Following up with some more on Sunday's Super Bowl, President Trump is making headlines once again, and not for the reasons you're thinking. After the Super Bowl, the president took to Twitter to congratulate the Kansas City Chiefs, writing, quote, congratulations to the Kansas City Chiefs on a great game and a fantastic comeback under immense pressure. You represented the great state of Kansas and, in fact, the entire USA so very well. Our country is proud of you, end quote. Well, despite the good intentions the president wanted to show, the problem was Kansas City is not in Kansas. It's in Missouri. After the backlash he received, uh, after the backlash he received, the tweet was quickly taken down and replaced with the same message with the correction of replacing Kansas and Missouri. This past Monday, Iowa, the first and arguably most important state, held the first caucus in the first steps towards the 2020 presidential election. However, the Iowa Democratic Party did not immediately release the results that same night, blaming inconsistencies in reporting on the delay.
As of this afternoon on Tuesday, February 4th, early reports show that Pete Buttigieg is in the lead, although only 60% of the votes are in. By and large, America is still unsure which Democratic candidate has definitively won the Iowa caucus. CNN reporter John Lawrence has more information on this developing story. The Hawkeye State is on hold. So you probably heard we don't know the results. <laughs> Iowa State officials say there's some sort of issue with Monday's caucus results, and they're combing over a paper trail of results. This is being run by the state political party and by volunteers, so no surprise that we'd be running into some problems. The Democratic presidential hopefuls have been trying to take matters in stride. It is too close to call, so I'm just going to tell you what I do know. You won! <laughs> And they're trying to be patient. Folks, well, it looks like it's going to be a long night, but I'm feeling good. I imagine, have a strong feeling that at some point, the results will be announced. As caucus goers wait and see who won the state, the quest for the White House rolls ahead. We take our message onward to New Hampshire, which has a way of making up its own mind, to Nevada, to South Carolina, and beyond to every corner of America. I'm John Lawrence reporting. Now, there is so much thrown up in the air right now. We have no idea what's going on. We have some of the early results, but not everything. We're still waiting on them. And but I just want to take it back to yesterday, last night. Um, Basically, all the candidates, as they were going out, giving their speeches, they were saying how they had some kind of victory or they won when nobody heard the results. But especially Pete Buttigieg, who did call it a victory. What do you guys think about that? Well, I think, first of all, caucuses are tricky. Um, for our audience, if you don't know, uh, it's not like what we do here in California, voting on a, at a primary. <laughs> it's very um, human intensive. So people show up, they actually show up, and they put you in corners of rooms, mm -hmm. and they say, I'm for such and such a candidate. And then they're counted, head count is made. And if a candidate doesn't hit a threshold of, say, 15%, those delegates are now up for grabs. And so there's a mad scramble to try to get them to come over to their side of the room, count, count, count again, and that's what's reported. So already it feels like it could go awry, right? It feels very messy. Throw in the fact that there's this app, right, that uh, went completely haywire. I mean, people, precinct leaders were saying they couldn't download it properly, and when they tried to call the DNC, there was nobody that they could talk to to help them through it. And so they ended up trying to call in the results. This is why there's such a delay. And then there was a two-hour hold, one precinct uh, leader said, and then they got hung up on. So this whole thing makes me very sad because if the Democrats are trying to put on a show, imagine this. How many weeks have we been hearing about the Iowa caucuses, right? This is kind of like a bit of a Super Bowl thing. That was I'm what saying. I was going to allude to eventually is that this is being treated more as if it's a game than it's like a state election. Like you're not voting for like the president of the United States. This is like which one of my which one on my team is going to win. Right. And it's just historically speaking, like I understand it. We have Jimmy Carter back in 1976 and we have Barack Obama in 2008. They both had those positions where once they won that caucus, that kind of gave them that momentum that compelled them to eventually become the Democratic nominee. However, there's also times like Senator Ted Cruz back in 2016, yeah. who also won but I did not win the presidency, obviously. Right. And so it's just at this point, it's becoming tiring and it's becoming boring at this point where it's not genuine anymore. And I don't feel like we're voting at this point. It, it seems more like betting in a way. Uh, yeah, we're turning more to uh, technology, which back in 2016, everything with Trump and Russia and everything. Cambridge you, Analytica, yeah, so forth, yeah. Do you think that using technology, should we continue forward with that? I will say that, at least in my years, the few years that I've had, there has been an issue where the topic has always been how do we get younger people to go out to vote, right? Amongst everybody, but how specifically younger people. And hand in hand, young people, technology, it kind of goes together. And so I understand the, I guess, intention of doing this, but it's not working out, especially when you have all these tech errors. It's It right. reflects bad on the Democratic Party as a whole, even though it's obviously not everybody's fault, but it's it doesn't look good for everybody. It really looks terrible. 
It really looks terrible. And if this was a, you're saying, okay, it's just one state. That's true. But it's also a showcase for what's coming. And it does lead to momentum. You are right about that. So that's why Iowa is such a big deal. And now New Hampshire will be. Uh, by the way, technically, we should mention this, technically, uh, President Trump did win the Republican nomination. He was going to show up in person, but he showed up in Ohio instead. <laughs> He's he like confused. Con he was, he, the man's got to get a map. There's 50 states, man. How can you expect him to know all of them? All right, well, let's move on now to some more sports-related news, talking about Kobe Bryant Memorial, or the Kobe Bryant Memorial at the Staples Center, which was recently removed uh, from for the late Kobe Bryant, daughter Gianna, and the seven other victims that were on board that fatal helicopter crash earlier this month. The public memorial has been taken down after a week of the accident, and fences were put up around the site to keep the cleanup out of the public's view. Hundreds of flowers, candles, personalized notes, basketballs, and jerseys decorated the floors outside the arena, and the Staples Center president, Lee Zeidman, reported that over 1,350 basketballs were collected. He continued saying the memorial was, quote, truly amazing, given the outpouring of love from the city of angels, end quote. Vanessa Bryant has requested to keep items from the memorial, which will be sent to her family later. A bus en route from Los Angeles to San Francisco had to make an emergency detour after a passenger opened fire near Grapevine, California early on Monday. A Greyhound bus was traveling to the Bay Area from Los Angeles when a passenger pulled out a semi-automatic black pistol, leaving one dead and five wounded. According to CHP officials, the shooter was a passenger along with the 43 others, but his motives are still being investigated. The suspect is in custody and his identity remains unknown. There are everyday heroes everywhere. So um, I just want to say that uh, when we were reading about the story this morning, there were passengers who took down this guy, got the gun away from him, were administering uh, aid to those that were wounded. So that gives me hope for humanity. Um, uh, also, condolences, our heartfelt condolences to the passenger who passed away. She was killed. Um, so once again, a gun story. Um, small miracles, I guess. Here's the silver lining, I guess. It wasn't a school, although I just read Texas, what was it, Texas A&M had a shooting. But like, how sad is that? That's the silver lining that it's not a I school. Know. It's not an element. It's not like a I movie theater. You. It's not. I it's like you. it shouldn't happen at all. There's no really silver lining to these gun stories that we're reportedly talking about. And like, I do feel somewhat of like a broken record saying like, yeah, more gun rule, <laughs> like more gun control. Like, but like, there's only so much that like love, prayers, like good vibes. There's only so much that we can do without you know the same stuff happening over and over again and so um i don't want to make this too much about like gun control or anything but you know and also may i say too that this is still a developing story so we're not sure you know what his motives are we don't know how he got this gun but regardless of how he got it it's i will probably insist it's from a lack of gun control Brie, what know, do you think yeah. absolutely i just think that it's true i mean i we've what is this our third shooting that we've talked about on their port since last year and I just think it's so sad because nothing is changing no and we have no movement going on and we don't really know what's going to happen mm. one thing that I looked up uh, did some research on today and I saw that uh, Greyhound does have some because I thought like an airport do the, do, are there screeners do do, do uh, people look out like a TSA officer do they look for things like this and apparently they do, but it's not thorough. In other words, they kind of go through the line and they maybe pick out people who are a little suspicious, but they don't get everybody. And in the story I read, um, one guy said, I had a knife with me. And so I went to the bathroom so I could throw it away. By the time I came back to the line, they were gone. So I went and got my knife and put it back in my pocket. So, you know, maybe more screening will prevent things like this. But, uh, yeah, in a gun culture um, where... <laughs> Where people in Texas, for example, can open carry. I had a friend's daughter who was in school in Texas, and she said, I was terrified to go to class because all these students, it's like the Wild West mm -hmm. with their guns showing. So I do hope that we will come up with some solutions, maybe screening at Greyhound stations. Maybe this will prompt more of that. But, uh, you know, I don't know if that will solve everything. Yeah. <laughs> Over winter break, Cal State Fullerton's ASI Vice President Monsi Calra resigned from her position after various asserted harassment cases. Cal Calra was elected to office spring of 2019 alongside ASI President Aaron Aguilar. 
after supporting for an ASI food pantry initiative on campus that officially took an effect last November. According to the Daily Titan, Cholera was told she does not advocate for underrepresented communities nor understand discrimination when she has shown time and time again she has spoken up for the diverse, unheard voices during meetings. Other board members who worked with Cholera spoke highly of her leadership and dedication. It has encouraged board members to start using their voices and have open dialogue to allow welcome communication throughout campus. As of now, the position of ASI vice president is vacant. ASI will continue to work to serve the student body government going forward. And to wrap up our show today, the corona beer virus Google search have spiked as the recent weeks as the coronavirus continues to spread. What is the corona beer virus all about, you may ask? And I'm also asking myself, um, this is what we know about it. This past week, the top trending Google searches included, quote, corona beer virus, which is a Mexican beer associated with the infectious coronavirus outbreak. Their corona beer is not related to the coronavirus, however, and there are musings of misinformation going around asserting that by drinking a corona, one can acquire the coronavirus. This is untrue, as the virus cannot be spread by the punny beer, and nevertheless, these Google searches peaked starting in mid-January. And not to worry, though, feel free to have yourself a corona beer, as it has absolutely no connection to the coronavirus. I'm shocked. What a, what a story. Man. Well, and with that, guys, we, uh, that's all the time we have here on The Report for this episode. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for more news, views, and info. I'm Ryan Matthey. I'm Jefferson Denham. And I'm Bree Eastlick. Stay fresh, Fullerton.